Okay, so let me start. So yesterday we described the gauge sector of the standard model, gauge sector as well as the Higgs sector. And you saw how starting from SU3 times SU2 times U1, we can break SU2 times U1 into a single U1 group. So which means basically the unbroken subgroup of the theory is SU3, which of course is not touched, and U1. And then we have three massive gauge fields. And one uh, massive scalar, which is a Higgs field. So today we will start discussing how to introduce formulas into in this uh, uh, theory. Because after all, most of what we see are the formulas, right? The quarks, leptons, neutrinos, and so on. So the formulas in the standard model. Now here, the general <coughs> feature that has been observed is that the Left-handed part of the formulas, okay, they are the ones which interact with the charged uh, gauge bosons. So in fact, this is what was observed even before the discovery of standard body. Okay. And that's what you have to keep in mind, that there is an asymmetry between the left and the right sector. The left-handed formulas are the ones which couple to the SU2 gauge fields. Okay. Of course, before the discovery of the standard model, people didn't know about the SU2 gauge fields, okay, but they knew indirectly the effect of weak interaction. So the left-handed formulas took part in the weak interaction, whereas the right-handed formulas seem to be neutral. And this is what we are going to utilize. So in the context of standard models, this will mean that the left-handed formulas will transform non-trivially under SU2, whereas the right-handed formulas should transform trivially, okay, which should be singlet, because then the SU2 gauge field will not couple to right-handed formulas. Okay, so that's the general principle that we'll uh, follow in building the formula. Yes. So how do we know which exactly ones are the ones which are the ones? Because you can work out, for example, uh, the effect of electromagnetic uh, interaction. Okay. That will give you how the formulas scatter. Okay. Then we see the deviation. Okay. And one we will see from the deviation. Exactly. So in the right-handed formulas we'll see only electromagnetic interaction, but no weak interaction. Okay. Whereas the left-handed formulas will see both. Right. So that's the way you uh, figure this out. Okay, so let me begin by writing down the quark sector. Okay. So I'll first describe the first quark doublet, okay, which involves an up quark and a down quark. So let me write down the actual field content and then I'll try to justify <coughs> or at least give you some intuitive ideas to how one arrives at those. Uh, that postulate. So this contains left-handed formulas. These are in fundamental of SU3. This looks like a strange number, but we will see that this is exactly what we need to get the correct uh, spectrum of quarks. Now, the fact that the quarks should be in the fundamental of SU3, that's not very surprising. These should be colored, right? Quarks take part in strong interaction. And SU3 gauge fields are the strong interaction gauge fields. So this quarks should couple to SU3. As I said, left-handed quarks also have field weak interaction. Okay, so it should couple to SU2. And why hypercharge one third, we'll see in a few minutes. Okay, this is necessary so that this formula, if you remember, the electric charge is Pp plus Y by, or Lp plus Y by 2. 
So Y has to be adjusted appropriately to so that it produces the known electric charges of the quarks. Okay, that fixes the hypercharge content of the uh, of this quantity. So these I'll denote by U I alpha L. Okay, L stands for left handed. I this is the color index, a sub three index. So it takes three values. This takes this is the SU2 fundamental in, index. So I runs from 1 to 3. Alpha runs from 1 to 3. How do you know there are three colors? I mean, Funda under, they will transfer under fundamental differentiation. Yes. How do you know? Well, you know, this is experimental, right? I mean, yeah. it could have been the quartz transfer from in the adjoint representation, right? In which case, there are to be eight quartz. Right? So, experimentally, we know that the quartz transfer from uh, in the fundamental representation. Are there other questions? Yes, so you have to think of this as y as a diagonal matrix 1, 1. Right? Like yesterday, if you remember when you wrote u3 equal to a, q equal to l3 plus y by 2, right? l3 was half minus half. Acting in the fundamental representation, it's half minus half. Right? And y we took to be minus 1, minus 1 for the Higgs. Right? So for the Higgs, This was then minus half of minus one, minus one. So this gave you zero, 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 minus one. So if it is going to represent Q, yes. that is a number. That is a number, but there are two, two particles here, right? Because alpha runs from, forget about the color index. It's alpha runs from one over one and two. For alpha equal to 1 and alpha equal to 2, we have different electric charges. Okay, that's the way you will see this uh, electric charge coming out. Okay, in fact, let's do it right now. But is this description clear? Okay, what this means that U should carry an index I, right? That sort tells us that it transforms the fundamental representation of SU3. It should carry an index alpha, which runs over two values, okay, for fundamental representation of SU2. And this L is just a label. Just to make sure that it's a left handed quantity. Okay? So, if we uh, make one uh, more comment, then I'll count the charges. Okay. So, d mu u l, so this basically tells us that d mu u l, which of course will have i alpha component, <coughs> this is del mu u i alpha l minus i d mu u a. A I K U J alpha L minus I C A L A alpha beta U I beta L and then minus I by three S U. That's the meaning of these charge assignments. Okay. That this coupling of DMU A, okay, this T A is the 3 by 3 matrix, SU3 on 3 by 3 matrix, that's up in the fundamental representation of SU3. So this tells us, because you carry this SU3 color index, okay, it tells us that DMU A should couple to this, and this is the way it should couple. This tells us that CMU, okay, because it carries a fundamental of SU2, C should couple to it, and this is the way it should couple. And finally, this tells us that the S mu, the hypercharge that the U1 gauge field should also couple because it carries hypercharge of quantum units. And with this, then you can write down the kinetic term as this. Okay, here I have suppressed all the I and alpha indices. Okay, if you want to write the I and alpha indices, it is the U bar I alpha L, I gamma mu D mu, U L, I alpha. Okay, 
Alpha, I just wrote down explicit to the contraction of the ABC. D mu U L I alpha L is given by this formula. Sorry, D mu U L I alpha. The N has got to Is this clear? Okay, this should be the gauge field kinetic. This should be the kinetic term for the formula. Okay. So once I tell, once I give you the representation in, in which the particular formula belongs, okay, there is no further freedom in writing down the kinetic term and the coupling to the gauge fields. Okay. Then you take psi bar i gamma mu d mu uh, del mu psi, replace del mu by d mu. Okay. The definition of d mu is specified by how it transforms, in what representation it transforms, okay. and that's what is substitute. Yeah. <coughs> so once I give the representation, and for u1, the charge that the formula carries, its kinetic term and its coupling to the gauge field is completely specified. Okay, I don't have to say anything about how it couples to the gauge fields. Anything else will not be gained by that. Right? I can make this coefficient 2, for example. Okay, that will not be a gauge invariant uh, coupling. Is this point clear? Okay, so specifying the transformation law is equivalent to specifying how it couples to the gauge fields. Okay, just like specifying the charge of a formula in the for U1, specifying the charge tells you how it couples to the gauge electromagnetic field. Right? Here, the generalization of that is specifying the representation for non-orbital fields. Okay, so now let's See what this becomes. L q plus y by 2. Yes. Yes. You are talking about this this formula over here? Yes, okay. So how do I understand the second term? This term. Okay, because this is the SU3 gauge field, right? So it's coupling to U will be as if the alpha index is not touched. The alpha index is SU2 index. Okay. So another way of thinking of this is a TA you have to think of as a matrix in the SU3, in the 3 by 3 space, okay. and identity in the alpha beta space. Okay, So TA alpha beta basically means it's GI times delta alpha beta. Okay. So the delta alpha beta have just explicitly evaluated to write this in J alpha, right? That's why this index is the same as that index. The same is true here, right? This is an SU2 gauge field. Okay, so because it's an SU2 gauge field, its coupling is to the index alpha beta. The okay, I index is not touched. Okay. So if you want to write as a generator, okay, in this big space, you have to think of this as LA crossed with an I integer matrix. Okay, in the IJ space. So it's like LA alpha beta delta IJ. That will be the generator. Okay, in the full space. Similarly, here it will be TIJ delta alpha beta. And here it will be SU times delta alpha beta delta IJ. Is this clear? Okay, so this is the way you should think when there are multiple gauge fields, yeah, this is the way to think of this. That if for a particular gauge when you are looking at a generator, for that you pick the appropriate T, and for the others you just use identity, okay, delta function, the chronic delta. So what about the in this of gamma mu Gamma mu I have uh, not, I have subtest. Okay. So gamma mu indices will be just uh, put together at the end. Okay, so this is, so throughout this I am not writing the gamma mu indices. <coughs> okay, so that's, so this alpha is not the gamma mu index. Okay, that's period index is separate. Okay. Another question? Okay, so now let's see what this becomes. L q plus y by 2. Okay. So half minus half, right? Because why half minus half? Because it's transforming in the fundamental representation of SU2. Right? So L p is half minus half. And y by 2 is half <coughs> times 1 third, 1 third. Okay, because y is one third. So this is being taken in the alpha beta space. Okay. If you want to in there, represent this in the full space, right? It's just multiplied by delta i2. 
because color index is not touched. Okay, so these generators, L P and Y by two, these are all represented by delta I J in a color space. Okay, so that I have not just uh, not written out. Okay, all the I's will have the same L P plus Y by two. Okay, here if you vary from I equal to one, two, three, yeah, they are L P plus Y by two eigenvalues will not change. Okay, so this gives you then half plus one six zero zero and minus half plus one six. So that is two thirds zero zero minus one third. Okay. So this tells us that U I one L has Q. Okay, so let me call this Q. That's the electric charge. So what's the Q value of this? Q I one L. It's U I one L, U I two L, right? That's the way we are thinking of U. The top component is one. Second component is two. So what is the Q value for this? When you act on this, right? on U I one, U I two. U I one will be multiplied by two thirds. U I two will be multiplied by minus one third. So this has Q equal to two thirds, <coughs> and U I two L has Q equal to minus one. So when we shuffle this and write in terms of the photon and the other neutral gauge boson, okay, which is called the Z, okay. then the photon mu is multiplied by L three plus Y by two. Okay, that L mu multiplies the unbroken generator. Right, mu multiplies the L three plus Y by two. So with that L three plus Y by two will pick up this ideal value, two thirds for U one, and minus one third for U two. Okay. So this now you compare with what you know for quarks. U quark has what charge does U quark have? Two thirds. So U quark is this one. Okay? This is the left-handed component of the U quark. Down quark has charge minus one third, right? So this you have to identify as the left-handed component of the down quark. Of course, it is not an accident, right? I mean, knowing that U quark and B quark has Charges two third and minus one third okay. allows us to fix this hypercharge. Okay. You have to fix this in such a way that we get the correct charges for the quarks. Okay, I could have changed it to anything else that I like, right? You wouldn't get the correct charges for the quarks. Is this point clear? Okay, so this hypercharge assignment is determined. By demanding that at the end, when you work out the charges that the quarks carry, it should agree with the known charges that the quarks carry. Okay, which in this case happens to be two thirds and minus one third. Yeah, the L three plus Y by two is also unbroken generator, right? So when we rewrite this, see here it's written in terms of the what is about the T A. We have L A and then there is a Y sitting here, right? Okay, this is just a Y identity. But we said that none of these, neither L, any of the L components, nor Y, preserve the Higgs, right? Acting on the Higgs, it gives you something non-zero. But this particular combination, L3 plus Y by 2, acting on the Higgs vacuum expectation part, that is V0, gives you 0. So when you reshuffle this and write it as some gauge field A mu times L3 plus Y by 2 and some other gauge field, say Z mu, times some other linear combination, is the A mu which will represent the massless photon. Because mu multiplies the unbroken generator. Okay? That's the general uh, theorem, right? That for all unbroken generators, whatever gauge fields multiply the unbroken <coughs> generators, those gauge fields remain massless. The ones 
which multiplied token generators, they are, they are massive. So mu we know is massless. But mu comes multiplied with NT plus y by 2. So when you write down a covariant derivative like this, you want to pick the coefficient of mu because the coefficient of mu is the electric charge, right? Because you are identifying now mu as a photon field, that's the massless gauge field that you know. So whatever multiplies the mu will be interpreted as the electric charge. That's the reason why this combination is important. From the perspective of what we did uh, last time, this is the generator which is unbroken, okay, which acting on V0 gives you 0. Okay, that's why its coefficient is a gauge field. Okay, and hence this eigenvalue of this measures the electric charge. Okay, and that's what we want to compare with these two thirds and minus one thirds. Is this clear? Now there are two other fields like this. Okay, so let me write down. Will two other similar fields, two other fields. Okay, by similar I mean they also transform in the triplet of SU3, doublet of SU2, and has the same hypercharge. That's one third. So those are those I'll call C. I alpha L and P I alpha L. Just like for the U I alpha L, U I one represented the upward, U I two represents the downward. Similarly, C I one and C I two will represent the charm quark and the strange quark. So, C I one will it represent the charm quark or the strange quark? Why? Charge two by three. Yes, charm has to charge two by three, right? If we have this type of remember, right? So between charm, charm and strain, charm has star, uh, two by three, charm, strain has minus one, you know? So it's exactly like up and down. Okay. So C I one L is C I one L. This will be actually C I L. Okay. This is the charm quad, left-handed component of charm quad. C I two L will represent strange quark. Similarly, C I one L will represent the top quark C I L. C I two L will represent the bottom quark. Okay, and this assignment again follows from the fact that the top quark has charge two third, bottom quark has charge minus one third. This this favors means suppose there is three kind of favors, so that is actually not related to any gauge symmetry. Means that is just experimental observation. That's right. Means uh, each uh, means some new such kind of things appear. Then we have to include in standard model. Yes. Means, uh, yeah. That's right. Completely independent of gauge. Yeah. Symmetry. So this has nothing to do with gauge symmetry. So this multiplicity. Okay. In fact, there, there is not even a symmetry which uh, permutes this. For, from whatever we have done so given so far. It will be asymmetric, right? Because after all, there's not much freedom, right? I mean, once you have written this U, there'll be exactly similar action for C and for T. Okay? Where this part of the action cannot be changed, right? It's fixed by the gauge invariant. So they are paired with there is an exclusive symmetry that rotates U, uh, C and T. Okay, that's not gauge, that's a, <laughs> like a simply global symmetry. But later on we will see that we'll add terms in the action which will not uh, uh, respect that symmetry. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with this because I mean, we can choose to break some symmetry. Right? This is not continuous breaking. Just the explicit terms in the action will not respect that symmetry. So, at this time, you think that TT are not different? Like yes. Are at this level, there is no difference between uh, uh, U, C, and T, right? Because they'll have identical actions. 
right? And so you can perform an arbitrary rotation, SU3 rotation between U, T, and C, okay, as a form of the action will not change. Okay, you can think of this as a, a, a new index, okay. say S, right, and you add that you know, a new SU3 acts on the S index. Okay. But this symmetry will not be an exact symmetry of it. Okay, later on we'll add, we'll turn, uh, add turn in the axon which will not respect this symmetry. This is some SU3 global kind of Yeah, at this stage it's some SU3 global symmetry. Okay, now we have to look at right handed formulas. Now, as far as the color is concerned, as far as the SU3 is concerned, they are still triplets of SU3, okay? because uh, yeah. strong interaction doesn't distinguish between left and right handed particles. Okay. So they are triplets of SU3, okay. but they are singlets of SU2, okay? because SU2 coupled to SU2 gauge fields. Okay? That's what I had said earlier. So they are singlets of SU2. Okay. So all that is left is to specify the hypercharge. And this we will specify by demanding that they have the correct charge. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, that T3 plus Y by 2 should, or L3 plus Y by 2 should give us back the correct charge. Okay, so let's look at U. Okay, that this is smaller, lower case U. Okay. I, no index <coughs> alpha, so U I R. This, I'll, I'll deal with uh, these three together because we have identical properties, T and that. These are doublets, sorry, singlet, uh, triplets of SU3, triplets of SU3, singlets of SU2, and hypercharge is what we have to calculate. How did I break up into C and T? No, I mean, what are these things? Oh, because in the standard model, they are in up down quad, right? There is also charm and strange quad and top and bottom quad, right? So just U doesn't accommodate all the six, right? So I need three copies of the U, right? To incorporate charm, strange, and top bottom, right? That, that's what these things do. Is this okay? So I mean, we could have. Given the whole thing in terms of just one generation and then uh, I mean copied it three, uh, uh, three times, okay, but uh, I have given already the left handed part completely, okay, for the quad sector. <coughs> so these, what are the charges, electric charge of these quads? Two thirds. Electric charge doesn't distinguish between left and right, right? So they have, they have Q equal to two thirds. But we know that Q should be L3 plus Y by 2. What is L3 for this? L3 is 0. Singlet, right? So all generators of SU2 acting on them give you 0. So this is just Y by 2. Right? So this tells us hypercharge should be 4 times.
Yeah. So for this, it's the hypercharge is four current. Okay, just by demanding that you get the correct length. But we have not finished yet. Okay, we also have the right handed components of B, S, and T, and B. You see, unlike here, where one doublet pair contains two quarts, right? C, for example, contains both C and S, right? U contains both U and B in the left handed section. Here, because we are saying this, for each quart, you introduce the corresponding right handed pair. So for these, these are again triplets of SU3, triplets of SU3, singlet of SU2, and hypercharge. Can you guess what it should be? Minus 2 by 3. Because these are charges minus 1 third, right? Okay, L3 is 0, so y by 2 is minus 1 third, so minus 2 by 3. Yes? Well, if you don't have them, right, it will be contradictory to experiment, right? Because in experiment, we know that we, the, for example, the d quart has mass, right? Okay, so without the right handed component of d quart, you cannot put a mass down. Right? So you know that these terms, these things have to be there. Okay, the fact that they come from singlets is a more detailed property of how they interact with weak uh, under weak interaction. So okay, we could have tried, for example, to <coughs> put them into doublets. Right? There's nothing which prevented us from writing U and D in a doublet. Okay? It doesn't call kind of agree with the experiment, right? Because weak interaction couples only to the left-handed uh, quarks and not the right-handed. Is this okay? Now, at this stage you notice that even though I have given them names, right? I have called them, for example, here, this is SIL, right? Which came from this C. And I have introduced this field SIR. There is no really relation between them. Right? Normally, you identify the left and right handed part of the same field by looking at the mass terms. Right? But the mass terms couple the left handed and right handed part of the field. But if we try to write down a mass term, okay, say SIL bar SIR, right? that could be the kind of mass term that you would think of. Right? The mass term for the strange part would be SIL bar SIR. Pardon? That will not be gauge invariant because all the left handed quarks are in the doublet of SU3. Right? The right handed quarks are in the singlet. Right? And it's impossible to combine a doublet and a singlet to get a gauge invariant uh, uh, quantity. Okay? So at this stage, we cannot write down any mass term for the quarks. Okay? The quarks are massless at this stage. Is this clear? That's right. But I could have called this S and this D. Right? I mean, there's no, as I said, there's no relation between the uh, various uh, uh, quarks, right? Whatever appears on this side and appears on this side are totally independent. Okay, I've just given them names in anticipation of what they will become at the end. Okay, but at this stage, these are just names. Okay, the fact that I'm calling this D and that one that uh, UI2L, uh, DIL, okay, that's just purely a matter of context. Questions? <clears throat> okay, before I talk about the masses, okay, let me describe the left hand side.
Here again, we have the same feature that the left handed leptons, okay, leptons means electrons and neutrinos, okay, the left handed le leptons are sensitive to weak interaction, the right handed ones are not. So we introduce a lepton E alpha L. Okay. Leptons are not uh, uh, strong, uh, they don't interact strongly, so they don't carry any color index. Okay, so they are singlets of SU3. So E alpha L will be singlet of SU3. Singlet of SU3. Doublet of SU2. Hypercharge. What are you trying to get out of this? Out of the E? Yeah, yeah but what are the particles you, get, you expect from here? Electron and neutron, right? So they have charges 0 and minus 1. Okay, so you have to come up produce this 2 by 2 matrix with the eigenvalue 0 and minus 1. Okay. So Q is P3 plus Y by 2, sorry, L3 plus Y by 2. Okay. So this is minus half, minus half, sorry, half minus half plus Y by 2 plus Y by 2. Yes, hypercharges. One. If you put one, you get one zero. That will not be okay. If you are representing a positron, that will be okay. But this is the electron field. I mean, we have to, to, to take the convention that the fundamental field is electron field, right? We don't write QED in terms of the positron field, right? You could write it in terms of positron field, right? But it's just, I mean. We are used to think of electrons as a fundamental field. Okay. So you want 0 and minus 1. Right? And there is only one way you can get 0 and minus 1. Which is? Yes, minus 3. Well, minus 3 will not be 3. You can get 1 as minus 1, but this will be minus 2. So the point is that you can already see that this one has lower charge than this one. right? So this has to be the electron, okay? the minus 1. So y is minus 1. Yeah. <clears throat> and just like this, there are also M alpha L. This gives you muon. This gives you the muon neutrino. And muon. And let me call this uh, P alpha L, child F T. This gives you tau and tau neutrino. Okay, so this muon has a similar property similar to the electron. Okay, so the muon is negatively charged, just like the electron. Muon neutrino is neutral. Okay, so this will have exactly. Tau sorry, tau neutrino should be out. The experiments show that under weak interaction, right, the electron and neutrino couple. Okay, so the electron and neutrino must form a doublet. Okay, that that's the input. Right? That's why you put electron. We know one know that this has to give the electron and a neutrino. So electron is like this beta decay. Or that's right. Yeah, beta decay, for example. As I said, you could have also worked with positron. Right, positron and anti-neutrino would be paired. Okay, that's just the antiparticle of this. So you don't really, you don't need, uh, separately include the positron field, right? You have a choice of other using the, using the positron field and the uh, uh, 
anti neutrino okay, or the electron and the neutrino okay these are uh, equivalent yeah, I asked was that when he speaks the lower one, you have the minus one plus the upper one automatically gets charged minus. That's right. One, two, three, four. one doesn't know that they will form a doublet one to send the upper charge to minus one but the minus one. Well, but the point is then next one will have minus two, right? Yeah, so somebody has to know that. Yeah, we know that there are no particles of charge minus two, right? If there is a charge particle of charge minus two, then we would have done it that way. So that's where the hypercharge assignment is fixed by experiment, right? It's not something that is given to you. Right? You have to match it with known particles, and that's how you fix. Okay. And one thing I maybe I'll mention it later. Okay, that about the antiparticle. Okay, let me just complete the story. Okay. So now the right-handed electron from uh, leptons. Okay. Here you have E R mu R tau R. So this maybe I should have written it. So E contents basically E L sorry mu L and E L. Okay, that's the multiple charge. The top one is the neutrino, left handed component of the neutrino, bottom one is the left handed component of the electron. Okay, similarly, this is the left handed muon neutrino, left handed muon, <coughs> left handed tau neutrino, left handed tau. So, ER mu R tau R, these are singlets of SO3, of course, they don't have color strong interaction, but also of SU2. Okay, because right-handed formulas don't have a weak interaction. What about Y? Y is minus 2. Because y by 2 should, have minus, should be minus 1, right? So y is minus 2. Because again, use q equal to L3 plus y by 2. L3 is 0 on the same length, so y should be minus 2. What about the right handed components of neutrino? Well, the standard model doesn't have it because when standard model has formulated neutrinos are massless. Okay. But suppose you want to put passes through the neutrinos, right? Then you have to introduce new E R, new mu R, new tau R. This should be, of course, singlets. of SU3 and SU2. What about Y? Y is 0. Okay, right? because it's a charge less. Right? L3 is 0, so Y should be 0. Pardon? Yeah, so it's singlet of all gauge groups. Right? You could write down such terms. Well, yes. Well, it can be detected in the sense we'll see other kinds of interactions, right? Yes, so you, by gauge interactions, it cannot be reproduced. Right? That's clear. Okay, this will not be a couple, this will just be a free field, right? At this level, it will be a free field. It, um, uh, nothing can produce it. Okay, but we'll see that the Higgs can, uh, that can be a Higgs coupling. Now, maybe one thing I should mention at this stage, that 
the particles that I have written down okay, all have their antiparticles. Okay, but you don't introduce fields separately for antiparticles, right? Because if you if you remember quantization of fermions, right? Once you have introduced the electron field, right, it also contains the positron okay, and creation operators. Right? When you expand it in the modes. So once you have introduced the electron field, it contains the electron creation operator as well as the positron creation operator. Okay, so you don't have to introduce separate fields. But if we did want to introduce, I mean, write down something like a positron field, okay. what you have to do is to take charge conjugation. Right? Given there is a charge conjugation oper operation which relates a field to its charge conjugate field, right? that's not an independent field, but it is written in terms of original field. Right? You take a complex conjugate and then multiply by some appropriate matrix. Okay. So charge conjugation. Produces the fields for antiparticles. Okay. And I'll leave this as an exercise to check. Okay, or if we just go back to your the definition of charge conjugation, okay, which re requires a complex conjugation and then multiplication of multiplication by a matrix. That this takes left handed fields, left handed fields, fields <coughs> to right handed fields and vice versa. Okay, that if you take a left handed electron <coughs> and charge conjugate it. What it will produce is a right handed positron. Okay? Basically, you take well, you define the charge conjugate field and then apply 1 plus gamma 5 and 1 minus gamma 5 and see which one analyzes it. Right? If you start with a left handed field, which is annihilated by left handed was defined as 1 plus gamma 5 annihilates it, right? Okay. Then the charge conjugation we will find is annihilated by 1 minus gamma 5 and vice versa. Okay, so that's why we show the left handed field under charge conjugation goes to right handed field. So if you didn't have this, okay, if you have stopped from the standard model, then you will have no right-handed neutrino, but you will have right-handed anti-neutrino. Okay, we have left-handed neutrinos, okay, which are these fields. Okay, it's charge conjugate, okay, which is not a new field, it's already contained in this. Okay, because of course it's not an independent field, right? But physically it will represent both a left-handed particle and a right-handed particle, okay, left-handed neutrino and right-handed anti-neutrino. Is this clear? Yes. This one? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that given any field, okay, like the electron field, just consider a normal Dirac electron, right? That also contains positron creation of quantity. Right? So you don't separately introduce positron field in QVD. Okay. Nevertheless, you can define a charge conjugation operation, okay, which takes psi, okay, and take to psi c. Okay. You could take psi c as your independent field instead of psi. Okay. In that way, if you do it, then the positron will put play the role of the electron. Okay, psi c will be like the positron field, and um, the electrons will be automatically included in this. Okay. Now, suppose the original field was a chiral field. Psi was a chiral field, psi L. Okay. Then you can still apply the charge conjugation operation. Right? And you can ask the new field that you get, okay. is it chiral or if it's chiral, okay, is it left-handed or right-handed? Okay. What you can show is that if you start the left-handed field and apply the charge conjugation, what you get back is a right-handed field right? and vice versa. Okay. So which basically means that if we had only left-handed electron, okay, its conjugate will be right-handed positron. Right? That's what I was saying. So, for example, if we know the left-handed electrons take part in weak interaction, okay. this also means that right-handed positrons will take part in the weak interaction. Okay, not left-handed positrons. Now, this also allows us to add some new kinds of mass terms for these objects. 
So these are neutral under all gauge plates, right? Suppose you take the charge conjugate on this. Nu C E L. Is that possible, right? Charge conjugate field, I said, left, right handed will go to left handed. Nu C E L. Now you can write down a mass term, nu C E L bar, nu E R. L bar R coupling is possible, right? That is not zero, as we saw. So you can write down a mass term, nu C E L bar, nu E R. So these can be given masses without worrying about the rest. So on these, you cannot give mass, right? Why can't such a mass term be given for this? Because this is charge, right? Okay. E L bar E R. Sorry. E. If you take E L C. Right. E L C. We'll have hot charge. You have already taken a complex conjugation, right? So it will have charge plus one. E L C will have charge plus one, right? So E L C bar will carry charge minus one because you are comp again complex conjugated, right? So E L C bar E R we have total charge minus 2. Right? That's not gauge invariant. So this kind of mass term you can only give for neutral gates. So these are what are called Majorana masses of the neutrinos, of the right-handed neutrinos. Is this clear? OK, if we didn't have those, okay, then at this level, you cannot add any mass term. OK, if you have neutral particles, you could possibly add mass terms for them just by themselves. Exactly, where it's full gate singlet. Right? Yes. Electrons are not chiral, but just with ER, right? You could have asked, see, ER is singlet, right? Of SU3, SU2, and so on. So, why can't we add it on ERC bar or ELC bar ER? That term is perfectly possible, right? It doesn't vanish by any reasoning. This gamma 5 reasoning that we gave, right? if we take ELC bar ER, it is non zero. Right? Because L bar R coupling you can have, right? But what, the, what is wrong with that coupling is that it carries hypercharge minus 2. Minus four, right? Because ER carries hy hypercharge minus two, right? ER ELC will carry hypercharge plus two because you have um, taken a complex conjugation. Okay. But when you take the bar of that, it again carries hy carry hypercharge minus two, right? So it, a, a term like ELC bar ER will carry hypercharge minus four. Right? So that's not gauge invariance, right? It breaks the one gauge invariance, and that's why you cannot add such terms. Because if new one is charged under some other gauge symmetry, right, then you cannot give a mass term of this kind. Even if that is a mass, oh no, well, it once it is, it, it is charged, right, <laughs> it's not Mahayana because it's a carrying charge, right, it's complex conjugate, it carries, it carries a different charge. Is this okay? See, the Mahayana mass is, I mean, written in terms of the original new, okay, is basically multiplying two comp different components of new okay, in a uh, Lorentz invariant fashion. Okay, so that's why it can carry the total charge which is the double of the charge of each new one. Yes. No, it's not a U1. Charge conjugation is a specific operation that produces the antiparticle. Okay, that exchanges the particle and antiparticle. Is the same, use the same gamma matrix, right? Charge, charge conjugation operation by itself it doesn't care about what the gauge charge, how what gauge field it couples to, or what charge it carries, right? You take complex conjugation and then multiply by an appropriate gamma. Okay, that depends depends on representation of gamma matrix, and that has 
the same property as the original field except that it now represents the antiparticle. Okay. So this operation turns a left handed formula to a right handed formula. Okay. So don't think of charge conjugation as actually changing the sign of the charge. Because in this case, it doesn't carry any charge at all, right? So what does charge conjugation mean? So charge conjugation is that specific operation, which means complex conjugation multiplied by some matrix, such that the resulting field has exactly the same Lorentz transformation property as the original field. Is that clear? See, this field has a hidden spinner index, right? So under Lorentz transformation, it transforms in a certain way. If we just pick, take a conjugation, charge the complex conjugation, you will get a field whose Lorentz transformation properties will change, right? Because Lorentz matrix will be complex conjugated. But by applying another matrix to it, you ensure that the new field has exactly the same Lorentz transformation property as the original field. Okay, that's the charge conjugation operation. So why is it said that neutrinos are massless in standard mode? Well, because you don't have this in the standard model. No, but this new Marana mass term that you described. Yes. That one can write down without this, right? No. Because then you have to do it this. Oh. Right? But this one carries hypercharge, right? Yes. So you cannot write a Marana mass term for this one. Okay. See, because <coughs> the point is that we. If the news were by isolated by themselves, right, you could try to construct a mass term. For this, if you want to construct a mass term, it will also try to construct a mass term for the electron, right, which is charge. Okay, by SU2 gauge invariance, you cannot just separate out this and give it to mass, right? So, in the absence of right handed neutrino, it's not possible to write down a mass term, even by on a mass term, you cannot. This is a hypercharge in And uh, why are there no right handed neutrinos? It's an observational fact. Well, yes. I mean, yeah. see, as you can see, even if there are right handed neutrinos, mm -hmm. okay, at this level, it, it just doesn't interact with anything, right? right. So, yeah. in standard model, you will not see them, oh. right? At, before you couple to the Higgs. Oh. Okay. So, whether they are there or not makes no difference. Right? And because we didn't observe them, oh. right, for good reason, if we, even if they are, we cannot produce them, oh. we cannot detect them. So we formulate standard model in terms of the minimal number of fields that are needed, so you don't have this right handed part. But we are also detecting that they have some mass. Now you, we are detecting that they have some mass. Yes. Right. So one way of giving them mass is by introducing this right handed thing. For the right handed neutrinos. But that will not help us because standard new L will still be massless. Right? We have to do something more to actually make the new L's massless. Uh, mass. See, if you just give them mass, mass, mass term, right? They are massive, but they are not I mean, seen in the standard model, right? None of the part, so all the interactions that I've written down so far, right? These particles are just completely free. Right? They have no interaction with the standard model uh, fields. So you'll neither produce them nor detect them. Okay. So even if there are such particles and they get mass, right, it's completely irrelevant for what we see today. Right? Unless there is an additional coupling that couples these to the standard model fields. Right? These are like you are adding some extra free field sector right, to the theory, which has no relevance to what you are saying today. So the way eventually we try to explain neutrino mass okay, is introducing something like this, okay. but we need additional coupling. Just introducing something like this and giving them mass is not enough, right? Because they'll still remain completely decoupled from the standard model phase. In the weak interaction, you are not going to produce them, right? You're going to produce the these objects. Okay, so unless these objects somehow couple to this, the fact that these are massive. Has no relevance. Is this okay? So 
there is no principle which forbids from us from adding the right handed move changes. Yes, no, that has no, absolutely no principle which forbids us from adding. It says that if we add them, the only interaction would be some gravitational or other interactions at the very high exactly. end, which we are not seeing anything. That's right. Okay, but we will see that, I mean, once you have added the right handed neutrinos, there are other possible couplings that you can have, okay. Okay, which eventually will transfer the mass that we add here okay. to the standard model. Yeah, but in the absence of these other interactions, you, uh, you cannot do anything. Is this okay? Okay, so now we are going to describe how to generate masses. Okay, we will find out about the neutrinos for now. Okay, neutrinos are. In the standard model, neutrons are massless. So the basic idea is the following, that while we cannot write down a mass term, we can, we'll see that we can write down couplings of the form fermion, fermion, Higgs. Left-handed fermion, right-handed fermion, that coupling by itself is not possible, okay, because uh, uh, UL bar, one is doublet, one is uh, singlet. But left-handed fermion, right-handed fermion, and the Higgs. That is in principle possible because while right handed formula is a singlet, left handed formula, doublet, okay, and the doublet that the Higgs, Higgs belongs to a doublet, those two together can combine to give a singlet, to give a gauge invariant object, right? So let me write down the results, the, the couplings, and then it will become clear. So there are three kinds of couplings that we can have. I'll now consider only the first generation the up and down quark and the electron and electron neutrino, okay, and but the same thing can be repeated for the other generations also. So lambda u, u bar, i alpha l, u, i r, phi alpha. Let me write down all the couplings and we'll check if there is any. Lambda b, Okay, these are the in the for, within the first generation. Okay, these are the possible couplings. You can repeat this for every generation. So let's check one by one whether it's invariant under all the gates like this. What about SU3? Is this invariant under SU3? U bar i, u i. That's SU3 singlet, right? What about SU2? U bar i alpha l, phi alpha, right? So that's again contracted correctly. Okay, it's singlet of SU2. Yes? Is this clear? See, under SU2, this is not transforming, right? So even though the spinner index has contracted with this, even the u bar u, okay. this index has not contracted with anything. So u bar i alpha l u i r, it still is tra transforming as a conjugate of a doublet representation. 
right? So that has to be contracted with something that's contracted with pi r. Is this okay or should I? Is this okay? Now hypercharge, right? So let's calculate the y. How much was for u i alpha l? It's one third, right? One third, when you are conjugated, it becomes minus one third, right? What? So minus one third plus this one. UIR, right? That's two thirds. Two thirds or four? No, UIR is four thirds. Yeah. That's four thirds. And this phi had minus one, right? The Higgs had hypercharge minus one. So this is zero. Okay, so this is invariant on all gates. This one is a little tricky. First, for the SU3, there is no problem. U bar i alpha l di. Right? The i index is nicely contracted, so that's okay. The SU2 indices are contracted but in a somewhat strange way. So I have to say what is epsilon alpha beta is. Epsilon alpha beta is basically 2 by 2 matrix, which is totally anti symmetric. Okay. So epsilon 1, 2, epsilon is basically 0, 1, minus 1, 0. I sigma two. So let's see why this is invariant under SU two. Okay, so let's check this term under SU two. What happens to you? U i alpha L goes to R of G, if G is an SU two element. R is a fundamental representation. R of G, alpha beta, U, I beta L, okay, and then the bar basically complex conjugate. So that's the fate of this. DIR, nothing happens to it. It doesn't carry a two SU2 index. Phi beta star is R of G beta gamma star phi gamma star and epsilon alpha beta. Sir, yes. In the first term, uh, instead of the index will be beta alpha. Okay, if it's like, if you write it as RG dagger, it's beta alpha. Okay. But RG star, I just wrote that, just look at the components. I have written it this components explicitly, right? Okay. This means u i alpha l dagger, but that dagger is in the spinal space because alpha and l index have explicit relations, right? Okay. So u i alpha l goes to r g alpha beta u i beta l, right? On a complex conjugate, right? This just gets complex conjugate. Right? You would have written it as beta alpha if you had written r g dagger beta alpha, right? Not r g star beta alpha. Is this okay? So this is clear for everybody. This is the same produced phi. Phi beta star is Rg beta gamma star phi gamma star. Now let's look at epsilon alpha beta Rg star alpha beta. Sorry, alpha yeah. beta. epsilon something was wrong. Alpha you should have to change this, right? Yeah. The beta has come twice. It's just called alpha delta or alpha gamma no, alpha delta. Now, we have this combination epsilon alpha beta R g star, 
RG star delta <coughs> gamma RG star alpha delta RG star alpha delta RG star theta gamma this reminds you of something Is a determinant. This is two by two matrix, right? So epsilon alpha beta R G star alpha delta R G star beta gamma is the determinant of R G star times epsilon delta gamma. This is the determinant of R G star times epsilon alpha epsilon delta first delta gamma. Is this familiar? Okay, this is not familiar, you just write 2 by 2 matrix. These are after all 2 by 2 matrix, right? So, you can explicitly write down 2 by 2 matrix, evaluate all the components, and you will find that indeed this is determinant times epsilon. Okay, this is an identity. But this is what? Because RG is, in the, is just the SU2 matrix, right? It's in the fundamental representation. So, the determinant of RG star is 1. So you get epsilon, so this is, this then becomes epsilon delta gamma u bar i delta l i r i gamma. Okay, and of course the coefficient lambda u. Yeah. Okay, so this is then indeed SU2, invariant under SU2, right? This is the same as that. Okay, just the alpha and beta has changed to delta and gamma. The gamma index. Okay, otherwise that sum is at the time given to this one. So this is SU2 invariant, this is SU2 invariant by the same. Right? So, has exactly the same structure, right? Alpha, E alpha L bar, I beta star, and then epsilon alpha beta. So, you have to check the hypercharge. So, Y is minus one third, right? Because mu. DIR, what was the hypercharge of DIR? <coughs> minus two. Minus two third. Minus two third. And phi beta start, right? Phi beta had minus one. So when you complex conjugate, it becomes plus one. So plus one. Okay, so it's invariant under U1. And similarly, let's check here what is E? E alpha L bar. What was the <coughs> said hypercharge minus one, right? So conjugation will give you plus one. ER, ER had minus 2, yeah, hypercharge minus 2, and phi beta star has 1, And I should have said that to all this, you have to add the Hermitian conjugate. So to all this, you have to add the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, which basically means up to sign, you have ui r bar, ui alpha l, phi alpha star, right? And similarly for these and these. So these are the possible couplings. Okay, you can convince yourself that if you have just one generation, then these are the all possible couplings between the Higgs field and the formulas. But the question is, what does it gain us? 
Okay, that we, we added these couplings. Okay, but our goal was to try to get, somehow get a mass for the formula, right? So why are we going to, going to get mass? Because this, as it stands, it looks like the qubit coupling between a Higgs field and the PR formula. The reason that this, this helps us get mass okay, is because phi has to be expanded okay, as its vacuum expression value plus some other fields, right, which are the fluctuations around the vacuum expression. Term that involves the other fields, those will give the qubit coupling, right? Because they will involve two fermions and one scalar. Okay? But the vacuum expression value, okay, which is this V0, that's a constant. Okay? So that will generate a term that is quadratic in fermions. Right? And that's exactly the mass term. Okay, so let me write down the result for the quadratic term, and then it will probably become clear. So let's take phi as V0, as we had. So which basically means that in this phi alpha, we'll take phi1 is equal to P and phi2 is equal to P. in all of these. And we want to evaluate it only for this configuration because the fluctuations will give cu cubic couplings. Okay, which you will, of course, eventually we are also interested in that, but right now, for mass term, we just want to focus on this. So what mass term will you get from here? So alpha is what here? One, right? Because only phi one is on zero. Okay, so you get lambda u v lambda u times t <coughs> times u i one l bar, right? Alpha is one. U i r plus here you see beta is one. Beta has to be one, right? So alpha has to be two because epsilon is totally anti-symmetric. So epsilon two one, that's minus one. Right? In this convention, epsilon two one is minus one. So plus lambda v, lambda d times minus d u bar i alpha is two, right? So i two l that's it, and then plus lambda e, okay, again here beta is 1, so alpha it has to be 2, okay, epsilon 2 1 is minus 1, so lambda e times minus e, e bar 2L, plus Anderson. Is this clear what you are doing here? Right? We are evaluating this okay. by substituting for phi just this vacuum expression phi. Because that's what is going to give the quadratic term in the formula. Okay. And these are the terms that you get. So this is, let me write it more explicitly. So lambda u v. So what was u bar i1l? What was the interpretation of this? This was taken to be uil, right? Uh, ui one l was taken to be ui l. So this is u i l bar u i r plus minus lambda d e. This one is u i two l. What is the interpretation of this? D i l, right? So d i l bar d i r and then minus lambda e t. This was E L. The second component of E or E L. So E L bar E R. Okay. 
No, she will come in, in, in two, yeah, body, yeah, yeah, and those kinds of sounds. Well, for formulas, the size of the mass actually is uh, yeah. irrelevant, right? Because that can be changed by a phase. So what is important is m square. So mass is more of this, right? So this is our m u, this is m d, and this is m. Well, this is the mass of the u quark, this is the mass of the d quark, and this is the mass of the n quark. Okay, and you can repeat this for a higher generation. Sir, I think I really don't get the point that how the mass negative is only explained this Oh, because negative mass just means that you, you know, absorb a minus sign in the, in the definition of di l or di r. Okay. Okay. Right? See, for a formula, right? I mean, whether it's plus m or minus m, doesn't matter because the pole is always at k square plus m square equal to zero, right? It's the square of the mass, right, which determines the magnitude of the mass, right? If in the Lagrangian, if there is a m or minus m, right, the final physical mass doesn't get affected by that. Is this okay? So negative mass shouldn't bother you too much, right? If you don't like it, you just change the sign of lambda d. Okay? <laughs> but it's the same thing. You can absorb the sign sign of lambda d into a redefinition of the yeah, yeah. peaks. So let's see, these fields, for example, DIR, right? I introduce the field DIR. I could have replaced DIR R by minus DIR, right? The kinetic term, nothing will change, right? This side will change, get changed. Okay, similarly, ER, right? It's a, single, it's a single field by itself, right? So I can change its sign without changing anything else. Yeah, I can change the form. Conventional epsilon alpha beta also. I could have defined as a minus one one. <laughs> so many things can be done. But the upshot is that the sign of mass gain doesn't make a difference. Is this okay? Now you see that while this generates a mass of the formula, this also gives some new information. And that is a reflection of the fact that we cannot add mass term by themselves. And that information is that the mass of the quark is proportional to the strength of the coupling to the Higgs. Right? Because it's, he is the common between all of them, right? So the coupling to the Higgs, how strong it is, determines how heavy the particle is. And this is something you can hope to verify experimentally, right? Once you discover the Higgs. You can explicitly calculate, calculate it, measure its coupling to other fields, okay. and you can check if the couplings to the fields are proportional to the masses. Okay, that's a prediction of the standard model because standard model doesn't have independent parameters that gives the masses of the fields. Right? The parameters, the masses of the fields are related to the coupling constant. So from this, you can guess which quark will couple to the Higgs in the strongest possible. Top quark, right? Top quark is the heaviest, right? So that has the strongest coupling to the Higgs. Okay, and as you go down the list, different quarks will have different strengths of coupling. Okay, now there are two things I want to say, and I'll probably do it today itself. One is that here I consider one generation. Okay. You can repeat it for different generation. Okay, you can give masses to different generations of particles by exactly the same procedure because the transformation laws are the same. But you also have the possibility of coupling different generations. You see, this coupling is allowed, right? It's gauge invariant. Similarly, if we replace it by C and this by C, that's also allowed. But when this is U and that is C, that's also allowed, right? Because this UIR and CIR have exactly the same quantum numbers. 
we also have u bar i alpha l c i alpha l. Okay, with a different coefficient. So in general, this mass term that we generate this way will not be diagonal. Okay, because you will get couplings of this kind. Okay, but also couplings of the form Q with S. D can be replaced by S. Okay, so for example, in just, just besides having this coupling, you will have C I L bar U I R. Okay, that coupling is also possible. Okay. So in general, the mass matrix that you get will not be diagonal. Okay. But of course, that's not a problem by itself, you can diagonalize it. We just, this only means that when you actually try to define physical fields, we have to diagonalize the mass matrix. Okay? That's what we always do. Whenever the kinetic term is not diagonal, we redefine our fields to make it diagonal. <coughs> so you can make the mass matrix diagonal, but the price that you will pay now is that in the original basis, the gauge fields were coupling particles of the same type. You had U I L bar U I L, right? With some uh, gamma mu, uh, B mu and gamma mu C mu kind of coupling. Okay. In a new basis, what you will find is that that coupling is no longer diagonal. Okay. Coupling of the gauge fields okay, to the quartz. You can have a coupling of the form U bar I. Okay. Instead of getting U, you can get a C. So in other words, earlier we are getting a u bar i l i alpha l gamma mu b mu. Hey, let's let's give it one particular thing. Uh, w w plus mu. Okay. Let me write in components. So okay. if we expand this out, we will get a term like u bar i L gamma mu w mu plus. You have to tell me what this is here. What should come here? By charge conservation, you can figure out. Yes. This will be d. D i l right. If you look, if you follow the definition. See, this comes from basically the U bar I alpha L I gamma mu B mu U I alpha L. This, this coupling. Okay, when you expand it out, okay, in terms of the upper and lower components, you will typically get a coupling of this kind. Okay. So, in the original basis, okay, because the kinetic term was taken to be like this, okay, U was always coupled to D, okay, but not to S, for example. Okay. But what you will find is that after you have diagonalized the mass matrix, okay, which is of course possible, so that at the mass matrix level, at the quaternary level, there is no cross term. Okay. Now you will start getting coupling between U and S. Okay, and those couplings actually do exist. Okay, that this W goes on the massive gauge goes on, so we'll start coupling particles from different generations. Okay, of course, it's constrained by gauge invariance. Okay. You couldn't put here C. Okay, that would have a different charge altogether. Okay, but you could replace this D, you can have a coupling of the form U bar I L gamma mu W mu plus S I L. Okay, it doesn't violate any charge conservation. Okay, but these couplings will start arising if you here, to begin with, if we had cross couplings. Is this clear? So, let me repeat it again. So, in the original basis, we only had coupling of U to U, C to C, and T to T, right, as a SU2 doublet. Okay. So, the gauge fields would have coupled U to D, but they were U to S. But what we saw is that because the mass matrix is not diagonal, we have to redefine our basis. Okay, so the mass matrix becomes diagonal. Okay. So the new U, D, and S are not the same as the old U, D, and S, but some linear combinations of these. Okay. Once we express everything in terms of these new linear combinations, okay. now the price is that while the kinetic term has become diagonal, 
the couplings of a gauge which will no longer be diagonal. Okay, they will couple terms like this. So these are what are known as mixing matrices. Okay, that and you can observe them in experiment. Okay, what are the couplings of this kind? And you can actually calculate what the mixing matrix is by observing couplings of this kind. So basically, states of the same kind, right? So D, S, and B can mix with each other. Okay, and similarly, U, C, and T can mix with each other. When you diagonalize. Okay, and in that process, you will the gauge field couplings will get changed. Exactly. So, and that, of course, diagonalizing matrix is determining original couplings, right? What kind of cross couplings you have in Lagrangian? Right? In the Higgs sector, if there are cross couplings, right, that's what forces you to have a different basis, right? Because, yes, you allow all possible gauge invariant couplings, right? Many of them can be removed just by field redefinition. But to begin with, you can allow all possible gauge invariant couplings, okay, of cubic type, like this. Calculate the mass matrix, okay, then diagonalize it. Okay, and when you go to a new basis, you will find couplings of this kind. So now actually we have a theory of total chain parameters, which means nine lambdas and one gauge. Yes, but many of those can be removed by field definition. See now, not nine lambdas. You have three here already, but uh, three generations. So that's already nine. Yeah. You are not counting the cross terms. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> there is also the cross terms. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> a lot of couplings are there. Okay. Okay. So all of those couplings you have to, but not all of those couplings are independent. In the sense that many of those couplings you can just change definitions of fields to absorb them. Okay. But some couplings are left over. Okay. And for three generations you can count exactly how many couplings. Are actually physical, and those couplings will affect this cross couplings of this kind in terms of the gauge fields. Okay, you don't see them in the mass matrix. By definition, you diagonalize the mass matrix, okay, but you see them in the gauge yeah. coupling of the gauge fields. Is this point clear? That's right, yeah. So you have to work out, okay. I mean, you can think of it that way, but you are, otherwise you think of this as a two by two matrix in the LR space, and you have to find the appropriate eigenvalue, right? You can change basis to make this real. See, UIL bar UIR, right? And other, other term will be UIR bar UIL. Okay? These are in general different terms. Right? So you just, just don't add them. Okay? Because this is UIA or R, they, that is being conjugated, right? And this is UIL. Okay? So that, it's not that those are equal and you just add this with this complex conjugate. Right? You have to you have a mass a matrix which you have to diagonalize. Okay? Yes. Okay, there is a second point I wanted to mention, but I'll do it briefly, which is about the neutral masses. So for neutrinos, you have to add lambda nu P alpha L bar. Now it's nu R. Is this gauge invariant? So 
Minus sign somewhere again, but again, minus sign doesn't matter as I said for the formulas okay, because they are square. <coughs> but because of this, we 
we can see that there is another way of making the neutrino mass small okay, without actually making lambda nu very small. That is, that is why making them m very large. See, m was a very different kind of object, right? m was the object that coupled the, that gives the Maharana mass to the right handed neutrino. Okay. And this is totally neutral under SU, under all gauge fields. So one might imagine that because this is totally neutral under all standard model gauge fields, okay, it's a very massive particle. So this M could be large, okay, and so of course you don't know whether this is a real story, okay, but if it so happens that there are right handed neutrinos of, with large mass, okay, then there is a possibility of explaining why the neutrino, observed neutrino mass is so small. Okay, because this will identifies the observed neutrinos and this one is not observed because it's very heavy. So this is what is commonly called the seesaw mechanism. So that you basically make one neutron light by making the other one heavy. So mod lambda v squared into v squared. Mod lambda v square into v square? Mod will be within lambda. Yes. Yeah, and then there is probably a minus sign somewhere. Yes, minus of that. Yeah. Because the determinant, you can calculate the determinant. The right? determinant of this is minus mod lambda nu square uh, v square. Right? Yeah. So the determinant is a product, right? So there is a minus sign. Yeah. But this, all this is, of course, going beyond standard. Right? Standard model itself doesn't even have right handed neutrinos. Okay, but once you know the neutrinos have mass, this is a possible mechanism to generate neutrino masses. Okay, you can just drop here, you don't add this. Okay. This will be able to give neutrinos a mass. But this doesn't explain why this is small. Okay, so these kinds of masses are what are called the jazz mass for the neutrino. Okay. This one, okay, or this general mechanism is called the Maharana mass. And one way to distinguish this is what is called a double beta decay. Okay, one can show that if there is a coupling of this kind, okay, it should be possible to have a beta decay, okay, which has no neutrinos, okay, but it produces two electrons. Okay, but that's not possible in the when you have only the, these kinds of masses. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. So tomorrow I think I'm not going to have a regular class. Okay. We'll decide about the tutorial, maybe you people can just stay on and we'll discuss what to do tomorrow's this thing. Okay, but there'll be no regular class tomorrow. It will start again next week. Okay. Yes. That's right. Yes, it may have, have, but it, then it's a question of whether it's stable or unstable. Okay, it may be unstable particle which will eventually decay. And usually, when we introduce new fields, we write down all possible terms, right? That's so. Right. Once we introduce the right angle you know, there is absolutely no reason why we should not write them. That's right. Exactly. If you, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. use only all renormalizable couplings, you right. can certainly write down my master. Yeah. Except that these violates left arm number. So if you say that you introduce right handed neutrinos but also conserve the left hand number, oh. right, there is a global symmetry here, okay. then you don't introduce these terms. Right? So this actually violates the symmetry. A global symmetry of the symmetry. This also is a question that whether left hand number is conserved. Conserved number, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that's why once you introduce a Maharana mass of this kind, oh. right, it induces this neutrinoless double beta decay, which violates left hand number. Yeah. So you produce two electrons and no neutrinos, right? So you are certainly violating the number one.